Consider the graph of e to the x. If I wanted to compute a value like, say, e to the 0 0.2, well, I could do that. I could go to some calculator and just plug it in. But how does the calculator know what e to the 0 0.2 is? In today's video, we're going to talk about one of the most powerful theorems in all of calculus and perhaps all of mathematics, Taylor's theorem. It's the way that an enormous amount of mathematics actually works and is actually done behind the scenes in computers and out in the real world. It's going to be incredibly important for us. The idea is we want to figure out how to do approximations in a more sophisticated way than we've done in the past. For example, imagine that you're in high school and you don't know calculus and you have to figure out, well, what is e to the 0.2? One of the things that you could do is say, look, e to the 0 is a number that you know, e to the 0 is just 1. So what if I considered, instead of e to the x, just y equal to 1, the constant function 1? Now, approximating e to the 0 0.2 by 1, it's not bad. There's a sort of like little error that remains here. It's not that gross of an error. But if I considered e somewhere larger and further away from 0, well, this error grows to be really, really large. And it grows to be large pretty quickly. In calculus, we developed a better way to do this. We had the idea of a linear approximation. So instead of a constant function, a constant line, what we're going to do instead is have a tangent line. Now for this tangent line, our approximations are actually quite a bit better. It is a better approximation. And the closer that you go to wherever you've put the tangent line, in this case it's the tangent line at zero, the better your approximation gets. So this tangent line is pretty good. But can we do better than that? Can we do better than just a linear approximation? For example, imagine I instead try to put a quadratic, not a line, a quadratic as the thing that was going to approximate e to the x around the value of x equal to zero. Maybe it would look a little bit like this one, where I curl it up and I put in a quadratic and I make the quadratic just touch at the point of x equal to zero and to have a very similar slope and it just it really nicely aligns, and now my error is actually pretty good. There's almost no space that I can visualize at all. And if I can do that for a quadratic, I can do the same kind of things for a cubic. It becomes an even better approximation. And I can even go further to a quartic, or however long you want to do, as many terms as you might wish. But how do I come up with these polynomials that so nicely approximate in some little region? How do I know whether this is the best a polynomial to approximate with? And, and how good of an approximation really is it? Well, that is going to be the core of our study of Taylor series. And then if I want to put all of these on top of each other, I have the blue e to the x. And I put the constant, the linear, the quadratic, the cubic, and the quartic approximations all on the screen. And what you can see is that the higher the degree of the polynomial, for example, the quartic, the better the approximation becomes. All right, so let's go all the way back to linearization when we just approximated with the tangent line. Let's remember what we did there and then we're going to generalize. So the first thing we say that when I'm doing a tangent line is that at the value of x equal to zero, the spot where my tangent line is at, I'm saying that the function and the tangent line have the same actual value, their y's are the same, but also they have the same slope. So those are my two different considerations. So, for example, if I compare e to the x, the function that I have, and a generic linear, a generic linear of the form c0 plus c1x, that's what I mean by a completely generic linear function, then the first thing I want to do is say that at the value of x equal to 0, they're exactly equal. So I can plug in x equal to 0. e to the 0 is 1, c1 times 0 would be 0. That just leaves me with c0 being 1. Okay, not so bad, so I can put that in. Now I've got 1 plus some constant times x and, and e to the x. These are what I'm going to compare. But then what I'm going to do is take the slopes being equal. Now, the slopes mean take the derivative. So I'll take the derivative of both. And then if I plug 0 into that, e to the 0 is again 1. And I get that our c1 is 1 as well. So what do we have? Our approximation is then that this e to the x is being approximated by 1 plus x. Which is not to say that they're exactly equal. Indeed, far away from the value of zero, that becomes a worse and worse approximation. But nearby, it's not bad. Slightly more generally, the linear approximation is going to be that f of x is approximately f of zero plus the derivative at zero all times x. And 
I'll let you recall how we did that in Calculus 1. It's the same idea what we just walked through. Well, now let's go up to degree 2 polynomials. So instead of just this tangent line, I'm going to go and try to approximate it by a quadratic. And the restrictions are going to be the same two initial ones. It has the same y value and it has the same slope. But in addition, I'm going to demand that it has the same concavity, that when I've got this quadratic, it's got three different restrictions on it. And then a generic quadratic can be written as a c0 plus a c1x plus a c2x squared, which is to say a generic polynomial with three different coefficients. I've got three different conditions. I think it's going to work out. So... Same story that we did before, let's first plug in the x equal to 0. If I do this, most of the polynomial goes away, and you get e to the 0, which is 1, is just your c0. So I can replace my c0 with that 1 for my polynomial. Now I'm going to take the derivative, because I want the slopes to be equal on these two things. Again, I will say that this is at 0, so it's my slope being equal at x equal to 0. So I'm going to plug in 0, and I get e to the 0, which is 1, is c1 plus a bunch of stuff, which is 0. So that tells me my c1 now is also going to be equal to the value of 1, so I'll replace everywhere there's a c1 with a 1. Now I want to look at concavity, which is the second derivative. So I take the derivative one more time, I plug in x equal to 0, and what do I get? e to the 0 is 1, yet again. So c2 is 1 half, and I can replace all the c2s with 1 halves. Which is to say that what I have is this polynomial here, this 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared, that is how I came up with the quadratic that is going to well approximate near the value of x equal to 0. Okay, this is how I did it for e to the x, but let's take that idea and let's generalize it. Let's do it for all functions, at least functions that have power series. That is, I take a generic f of x and I set it equal to a power series and say that this converges for some radius. And the question is, well, what are the coefficients? What are the c0, the c1, and so on? Well, let's take a few derivatives, as I did in my example with my quadratic. In that case, first derivative is going to mean that my c0 term goes away, my c1x term becomes just c1, and then x squared to 2 comes down, x cubed to 3 comes down, and so on. In general, the nth term the cn x to the n, the n comes down, and I'm left with this n cn x to the n minus 1. Let's do one more derivative, so now I'm going to knock out the c1, the 2c2 is all that remains, and then in the term that started as x cubed, first the 3 went down, and now the 2 goes down, and I'm left with multiplied by x. If I go to that nth term, first the n came down in the first derivative, now in the second, an n minus 1 comes down. I'm going to step away for a moment because there's not enough room, but if I take the nth derivative now, well, all the lower order terms, the terms where the power of x was less than n, all of those have had enough derivatives that they go to zero. For the nth term itself, the x to the n, well, first n down the n, then the n minus 1, then the n minus 2, in general, this is an n factorial when I do it n times. That's just multiplied by the cn, the x goes away. And then I have a whole bunch of more higher order terms where the x's remain. Now, after taking derivatives, well, what did we do previously? We plugged it in x equal to 0. So let's, everywhere there's an x, I'm going to replace this with a 0. And now this gives me a series of equations. I can compute what all the different c values are. So for the first line, every single thing except for c0 is indeed 0. So c0 is just f of 0. For the second, everything about the first remaining coefficient, c1, is 0. So c1 is just f prime of 0. c2 is f double prime at 0 over 2. And generically, cn is you take n derivatives of it, and then you divide out by this n factorial thing to make it balance. By the way, these first few terms I can interpret in the language of factorial. 0 factorial is just 1. 1 factorial is just 1. 2 factorial is just 2. So I can replace those coefficients in the denominator. And so it's quite compatible with the generic form. You take n derivatives and divide it by n factorial. Indeed, a Maclaurin series is one where you're doing a power series around x equal to 0. You compute out what the coefficients are, and indeed you get precisely this, these n derivatives at 0 divided by n factorial. The fact that I plugged in x equal to 0 here is in a sense unimportant. I can actually just shift this, so everywhere there's a 0, I can put it in an a, so it's x minus a, and the radius is the absolute value of x minus a less than r, and the derivative is evaluated a. 
So it's just a slight shift, and in that more general case, I call it a Taylor series. A McLaurin series where A is zero is just a special case of the true thing, Taylor series. Okay, so let's look at that example that we had before. We started with e to the x, and I'm doing it around a equal to zero. Zero is the spot where I'm approximating it. Then if I plug into my big gnarly formula, all right, in place of the nth derivative, I've written it down here in Leibniz notation, the nth derivative of e to the x evaluated at zero. But for e to the x, the first derivative is e to the x, the second derivative is e to the x, e to the x is all the way along. So it's just e to the x when I take n derivatives. Plugging in zero, it's e to the zero, which is one. So all of that mess goes away, and I'm just left with x to the n over n factorial. So this is the Taylor series for e to the x. Final thing I want to do is show up the graph now of cosine with its first and second Taylor polynomial approximation. So this is the blue cosine, and then I have the tangent line to cosine, which is just the line y equal to 1 and the quadratic approximation, which is 1 minus x squared over 2. Now, what I want to notice that this critically depends on the fact that I am doing this approximation about a equal to 0. Indeed, these approximations look pretty good for values near 0, the quadratic one in particular, but far away, I mean, quadratic is dropping off to minus infinity, far away it's going to be a terrible approximation. Now, what is fascinating about Taylor series to me is that the computation only depended the derivative exactly at the point a equal to zero. That's the only thing you needed to know. But when I graph these, it's a pretty good approximation, not exactly at zero, but nearby. There's a sort of a whole region where it's pretty nice. We haven't quantified yet exactly what we mean by pretty nice being a good approximation. But the general idea that you're using information all taken at one point to get an approximation nearby, you get local information from this exactly one point, is an incredibly powerful and broad idea. And indeed, if I now change that point, so instead of a equal to zero, let's just move it over. Let's move it down to a equal to pi. And you can see how the quadratic and the linear approximations change with it. You get now a different quadratic that approximates this at this different point, and near the value of a equal to pi, it's pretty good. Indeed, my polynomial has an x minus pi squared in it. This is centered at the value of pi. So Taylor series takes information at a point of specific a and gives you information nearby that particular value of a. It gives you local information. 